With Zen 3 CPUs just around the corner, you may be asking yourself if it's worth looking into a refresh of a year old design. The 3900 XT is pricey, coming in at a 20% premium over the 3900 X in some regions. It also doesn't come with a cooler, so if you're building the system for the first time, you're going to have to look into third party cooling. But what if you already have a cooler and you have a motherboard that can support the 3900 XT? This review is going to be from the perspective of somebody who has pretty much the baseline requirement for the 3900 XT in both motherboard platform as well as memory. The 3900 XT costs about $50 more in Canada, which is about $38 USD than the 3900 X at the time of writing. And since there wasn't a lot of coverage on this chip, in general, there's only a couple YouTube videos about it. I figured I'd show my experience with the chip. Today, I'll be showing you guys the test results for both synthetic and production-based workloads, as well as power consumption and temperature measurements for this CPU. I'll also be showing some gaming results, but I'd like to emphasize that if you're looking into a 3900X or 3900XT, um, and you're just going to be gaming, you should really look into something like a Ryzen 5 or a Ryzen 7. That way you could put more money into a new graphics card and that way you'll get better performance in your games. Since there wasn't a lot of Linux coverage on the CPU as well, I thought I'd do a little bit of testing inside Manjaro Linux. This is on the 5.6 kernel because uh, programs like Blender um, tend to work a little bit better inside Linux, so I figured I'd show the results for that as well. I upgraded from a Ryzen 5 2600X uh, and since this is my first product review, I'll only be showing data for the two chips. We'll start with the synthetic test. Cinebench R20 is first, and we can see that the stock 3900 XT pulls some pretty impressive multi-core numbers over the stock and overclock 2600 X. Overclocking the 3900 XT also sees a nice 650 point lead over stock. Single core scores are less impressive, but there are clear improvements when overclocking. Onto Geekbench 5, and the results are more or less the same as on Cinebench. Much higher multi-core scores for the 3900 XT and fairly tame results when overclocking. The story changes a bit when running the same test in Linux where we can see a 400 to 500 point increase across the board. Finally, we'll be looking at the 7-zip's built-in benchmark which is measured in MIPS for both compression and decompression. Looking at the chart, we can see that by having twice the amount of cores and higher clock speed, the 3900 XT is able to pull far ahead of the 2600X in both tests. Overclocking does allow the 2600X to perform a little better, but the 3900XT does a much better job when upping the clock speed. Now that we've established a baseline for performance between the two chips, let's take a look at results for workloads that are a little more realistic for people who are trying to get work done. Our first test is Blender, which is a popular and free 3D modeling application and is great for benchmarking both CPUs and GPUs. The 2600X at stock took almost 5 minutes to complete the BMW render test and overclocking it to 4.2GHz manages to reduce that time by about 20 seconds. The 3900XT handles the render in just 2 minutes and overclocking it to 4.4GHz gets a speed up of about 12 seconds. Moving that same workload over to Linux sees the 2600X finishing almost a minute faster than Windows at stock while overclocking it saves an additional 40 seconds. The stock 3900XT gets a 15 second lead and overclocking results in a further 12 12 second uplift. The barbershop test is much more demanding than the BMW test and features many advanced effects like ray tracing. The 2600X at stock and 4.2 GHz both struggle with this one and took nearly 20 minutes to complete. The stock 3900XT fared much better at just under 8.5 minutes while overclocking it sees a nice 39 second saving over stock. Running the same test in Linux helped the 2600X reach 17 minutes at stock and 16 minutes when overclocked. The 3900XT sees a big improvement in Linux with the stock chip finishing in 7 minutes and 9 seconds and finishing in just 6 minutes and 37 seconds when overclocked. From these results we can see that if you use Blender a lot and your workflow allows it, switching to Linux may actually help you with your render times if you're pushing that workload onto your CPU. Next we have DaVinci Resolve which is a video editing program designed by Blackmagic and it's what I use for video editing. Instead of running Puget's benchmarking tool, I grabbed all of the project files and rendered them out to 4K60 using H.264. This allowed me to show you real world results for rendering with time as the output rather than an arbitrary score. The stock 2600X manages a time of almost 3 minutes for this test and overclocking it shaves a modest 12 seconds from the render. The 3900XT finishes the render in a minute and a half while overclocking gets it down to nearly half the speed of the stock 2600X. This will be the last production based workload and I chose the TK Glitch Linux kernel compile as it stresses out the entire CPU and gives a nice time output at the end of the compile. I'll be compiling the 5.9 Linux kernel with parameters customized to run on my 
old Lenovo T420 that I recently upgraded with new parts. Compiling the kernel with the stock 2600X manages a brutal 23 minutes and doesn't get much better when overclocking. The 3900XT is a different story and manages to compile the kernel in a little over 9.5 minutes, while overclocking to 4.4 GHz speeds it up to a further 9 minutes and 11 seconds. On to gaming benchmarks, if you didn't watch the beginning of this video, I want to reiterate, you really shouldn't be buying this chip for gaming. Go with a Ryzen 5 or a Ryzen 7 and put that money into a better video card that'll push your frame rate higher than any CPU upgrade will give you. Our first gaming test is Rainbow Six Siege, a first person shooter that recently added the Vulkan API which should allow us to take better advantage of our CPU. At stock, the 2600X sees a very playable average frame rate of 284 and 1% lows of 211 FPS. The story changes a bit when overclocking, the average frame rate stays within margin of error but we see lower 1% lows than stock. This can be down to inconsistency in the benchmark or that frame rates take a hit when overclocking. Each test is run three times and then average, so I would say it's probably the latter. Moving up to the 3900XT, we can see that the average frame rate jumps up to 323 at stock and stays within margin of error when overclocked, though 1% lows do increase when overclocking that chip. Rage 2 is another Vulcan game, but it's also open world, which should help us potentially leverage the higher core count better than something like Rainbow Six Siege. The game is very smooth frame rate wise during general gameplay, but when driving the game starts to stutter when reaching high speeds. This is clear when looking at the results for both the stock and overclock 2600X. The game averages about 144 FPS, but takes a turn for the worse as soon as you start driving. 1% lows plunge into the mid 30s, which makes for an extremely stuttery experience, and overclocking doesn't create a big enough uplift to help with that. The 3900XT maintains similar average frame rates to the 2600X, but manages 1% lows three times as high. Since Rage 2 doesn't have a built in benchmark, a run was created by selecting the same destination run to run and loaded from the same save file, which explains the slightly lower average FPS for the overclock 3900XT. Dirt Rally 2 is a DirectX 11 game, but manages to scale very well with all configurations, not much has to be said here, both the stock 2600X and 3900XT see improvements to average as well as 1% lows when overclocking. CSGO runs on a now ancient DirectX 9 API but does still scale rather nicely with CPU clock speed. You can see that no matter the core count or clock speed, the game's 1% lows all sit within margin of error at 109 to 111 FPS average. Average frame rates are vastly improved when overclocking the 2600X, netting almost 90 extra FPS. The 3900XT manages even higher scores at stock, but overclocking only adds about 4 FPS to the average. Our last test isn't going to be about frame rate, but rather turn time in Civilization 6. This was done using the game's built-in AI benchmark. The stock 2600X manages an average turn time of 7.7 .7 seconds, while overclocking yields a 0.1 second time saving. The stock 3900XT is slightly faster than the 2600X at 6.8 seconds, and overclocking sees a similar time saving a 0.1 second. With games out of the way, let's make our way to the power consumption and temperature tests. These tests were all conducted by doing repeat runs of Cinebench R20 until reaching max TDP, voltage, and temperature. The systems were also left to idle for about 5 minutes to calculate the minimum values. Power consumption is first and we can see that the 2600X at stock speed sips about 24 watts at idle and ramps up to 125 watts while under load. Overclocking and setting the voltage to 1.875 volts bumped idle consumption to 27 watts and 144 watts under load. At stock, the 3900XT manages a slightly higher idle wattage of 30, but actually consumes less power under load than the overclocked 2600 600x at only 142 watts. Overclocking and setting voltage to 1.3375 results in idle consumption within margin of error to stock, but a massively higher load wattage of 190. Next are idle and load voltages of both chips. The stock 2600x idles at about 1.35 volts while under load and voltages exceed the maximum recommended voltage of 1.45. Tweaking clock speed and voltage allowed the 2600x to use slightly more voltage at idle, but kept load voltage voltages at a much more manageable 1.4 volts. The 3900XT at stock manages to use less voltage than the idle 2600X but skyrockets to 1.5 volts under load, much higher than the 1.45 volt recommended voltage. 
The 3900 XT does impressively when setting voltage manually and manages a lower idle voltage than the Tweet 2600X and has the lowest max voltage than any other configuration. Our final chart is for temperatures and rather than showing you the exact measurement from Hardware Info 64, I converted my result into a delta T value. Essentially, you're going to add this delta T value to the ambient temperature in your house, so look at your thermostat. Add it to this value and that's how this exact system will perform thermally in your environment. We can see that both chips perform similarly when it comes to idle temperatures, the outlier being the stock 2600X as the 280mm cooler at 100% would be considered oversized for that chip at stock. Max temperatures are also well within TJ Maxx when under load on all configurations. The overclock 3900 XT performs the worst thermally but that's to be expected. The EVGA CLC 280 does an okay job with cooling but at a couple fans for a push-pull configuration would be optimal. As a drop-in replacement for the 2600X, we can see that the 3900 XT is a sensible upgrade if you intend to do heavily threaded workloads like Blender, DaVinci Resolve, or compiling code. The gaming benchmarks are less impressive, but if you're looking to do some work on your PC and some gaming on the side, this processor would definitely be a good fit, especially if you're looking to revive an old 1700X system. I hope this video was able to illustrate the performance gains from upgrading to Zen 2's final outing in the desktop space. If you enjoyed the video, hit the like button. I'd also love to hear any suggestions for any improvements I can make to my content in the future in the comments below. I've got quite a few videos planned for the next couple weeks, so if you want to stay up to date, hit the subscribe button. And other than that, my name is Nick and thanks for watching.